thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Morrison. Thank you. First, uh, of course, to thank the library for having us. Um, all the hard work that made this evening possible. Wanted to thank everyone. Um, and as well, um, I wanted to thank, uh, of course, um, those of you who braved this frozen ass night to come here. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for this. And finally, of course, um, I wanted to thank my interlocutor, Ms. Toni Morrison. Um, as we know, the most important uh, writer writing in English today. Uh, it's an enormous honor. I thought I would just give you a little outline of how this is going to go, yeah? And then we jump right in. It's simple, we got about an hour. Ms. Morrison asked that perhaps we'll get four questions at the end. So, guys, four questions, Toni Morrison. <laughs> Like, honestly, save the meatball shit for later. <laughs> yeah. For real. <laughs> honestly. I beg you. For real. <laughs> so, and that's basically how it's going to work. Yeah? Um, Ms. Morrison, I, I, again, I wanted to thank you. Um, I'll keep my preamble as limited as possible. I mean, for me, of course, I think I speak for many of us. Um, Certainly, the axis of the world shifted for me when I first went to college. I, I'll never forget um, my first class, first semester, first week at Rutgers University. And it was a class with me, uh, with Abina Busia, and she was teaching, yeah. Professor Busia, and she was teaching Song of Solomon. Yeah. And uh, the axis of my world shifted and it has never returned, yeah? Um, and so... As an improvement, you know I mean? Yeah, much... <laughs> much warmer <laughs> and brilliant place I am in now, <laughs> yeah. So I wanted to say that, but then I just wanted to just jump right in, yeah? Folks, y'all want some stuff, let's do it, right? Yeah? Let's do this. Mm -hmm. Guys, uh, especially for the young folks out there, I think it's okay not to pretend that you got everything memorized. So, <laughs> I don't give a damn how uncute this shit looks. I'm gonna read, all right? For real, I'm gonna read. I said to someone earlier, the terror strips away about four-fifths of your brain, so, yeah. <laughs> And because, uh, look, and because we're talking about Toni Morrison here, the breadth of the career means that it's perhaps wise to focus in, in certain specific areas. Yeah, I wanted to begin, of course, um, by talking about uh, a part, and we'll get warmed up, move towards some heftier things, I would think, but I wanted to talk about a part of your career, I think, that doesn't get much light. Um, certainly, I think the, the younger generation doesn't really know to wear so much of um, your work for many years as an editor. Uh, oh. For many years, you were perhaps with perhaps the most important editor for African diasporic letters in the hemisphere. Um, if I can just sort of read, um, if I can read some of the things, you were an editor at Ramda House, where you edited black artists and thinkers, Gail Jones, Tony Cade Bambara, Angela Davis, Henry Dumas, Muhammad Ali, Huey P. Newton, George Jackson. Not quite George Jackson. No, George, you didn't get George in there? No, no. <laughs> His mama said no. Oh, <laughs> I always thought blood in my eye was yours. No. <laughs> no. Yeah, and I wanted to ask you about that time and about that part of your life. Um, it was a mission, I think. For me, I spent a year right after I left teaching at Howard University. I spent a year in a school textbook company, L.W. Singer, for one year, which had already been purchased by Random House. 
and so I came there. And uh, when I began to write uh, seriously uh, at L.W. Singer, uh, I didn't really think a great deal about publication for myself. I assumed that the company hired me not to write books, but to edit them. So I was very quiet, and I didn't tell anybody, and I went to another <laughs> publishing house. But nevertheless, the job at Random was extremely important to me because there was a lot going on. As you remember, in the late 60s and 70s, even the 80s, I wasn't able to participate politically that is, running up and down the streets in parades and with a megaphone. But I thought it would be a shame if that information was not in a book, the history of it. So uh, I made it my business to collect African Americans who were vocal, either politically or just writing wonderful uh, fiction. And it was a little difficult um, for me at first because there were no agents, you know, the people who show you the books. You have to go sort of look, ask. There were a couple that I knew. And there was an um, African-American man, Charles, who had been at Random House anyway before I got there and who had sort of paved the way and then moved on to do his own publishing elsewhere. But uh, knowing uh, that if somebody brought me something like Henry Dumas, who was already dead by the time I published him, or to have Angela Davis come in and want to, you know, write her autobiography with me, uh, those were extremely important events. And it, I felt it was my duty to make it right. I um, was not very happy, uh, well, I wasn't happy at all with the way I thought other publishers edited and produced African-American work. I thought the editing was sloppy, I thought the productions <laughs> were mishandled, even the great books like uh, Roots and things, you know, when you read them carefully, you see that nobody was paying any attention. Uh, so, anyway, enough about me. I... <laughs> no, no, I, I want, wait, wait, wait. I just, want, I just wanted to follow up on this because I do think it's not, um, I think it's sort of extraordinary because if you kind of look at the hit list of folks that you were um, editing, at folks whose work that you helped in many ways to canonize, yeah? I mean, it's extraordinary you had a view into black America that I don't think many people had such a broad access. I mean, you were sitting across where the texts, you have someone like Muhammad Ali, who apparently gave you lots of trouble um, for the book, and then someone like Angela Davis. I mean, it was an extraordinary vision. And you mentioned something just earlier in passing um, that this was viewed as highly politicized, mm. that apparently there was something you one day looked at at your office, and I was wondering if you could just share sort of how that, how you felt to be in that time when there was such a deep, you know, reaction to the black civil rights movements, um, and you yourself were actually publishing these people who people were saying, these are goddamn communists, these mm -hmm. are traitors, these right. are people who are trying to overthrow, and some people kind of said, yeah, I'm trying to overthrow the country. Right, right. No, I, um, I always felt that the narrative that African Americans, particularly political ones, told, if they were manipulated by or in the hands of the mainstream publishing, it was going to automatically be restrained, and it wasn't going to be totally obvious. It was sort of like Frederick Douglass and those slave stories. You can feel them withholding mm. because they're writing for abolitionists, and they don't want to upset them too much. Um, and that gaze and that control, it, to me, is obvious. 
it's even there in some African American fiction, or I can feel that gaze that they're really not talking to me. You know, if you write a book and call it Invisible Man, invisible to whom? Hmm. Not me. So that's already a wonderful book that still has that other gaze. So I'm looking for projects that come from within, are unapologetic about what they are, what they're saying, and what they intend for other people. African Americans or anybody else to know. So, you know, I was not looking for Muhammad Ali to publish. He had already signed a contract with Random House. I have to tell you, he didn't give me a bit of trouble, but. Oh. <laughs> Damn internet. <laughs> But I tell you, who did give me some trouble was his mm. co-author, who was Herbert Muhammad. Oh. <laughs> Internet. <laughs> I have to say this. This is a funny story. But I was his editor, and he was being a co-writer who was really, really good. The book is out. The book is ready. We're getting ready to do a big tour. Um, Ali comes into the office of the room. The salesmen are there, the editor-in-chief, all the guys. They're overwhelmed. Look at his hands. How tall is he? I mean, they were just going nuts about this film. What? Oh, look, look. And he's preening. Or not, maybe he's just being Ali. All I know is he doesn't do anything because no one is telling him to do anything. So he does anything he wants. And he pays me no attention at all. If, some, if I ask a question, he turns and answers a man who hasn't even posed the question. So I'm thinking, well, I have to change this. And I remembered, I read a little story about him, some Jewish woman was being evicted from her apartment or something, and he sent her the rent or something nice. And I thought, oh, that's, that's it. Older women, he will do what I say. If I come to him as an older woman, maternal, so I would go in there and cross my arms. And I would say, Ali, get up from there. <laughs> you have to be somewhere. We're waiting on you. He would do all of it instantly. <laughs> Anything I said, so long as that was the way I projected myself. And he ah. understood who was the powerful one. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. And and just because I think it's, it's important to underscore that, I, even what, this, what you were saying just now about shifting the narrative center of the telling, the very fact that you were sitting across from these writers as a sort of a strong kind of north star to say, listen, you don't have to write by default to a white audience. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would think that just what you said really unlocked a lot of these books. I think the reason so many of these books are still important, so many of these books are embedded in the canon, mm -hmm. has to do with that very, very subtle shift at the heart of them, I would argue, that they were facing you, that they were writing you, and that in fact, in the heart of these books is the unspoken premise that there is a black woman as mm -hmm. the reader. True. <laughs> That's true. And. Um particularly in the fiction, the political work you couldn't always decide. I knew who Angela Davis was, and everybody sort of knew what she thought. But when you get somebody like, uh, I don't know, Gail, or uh, <coughs> Tony Cade, <coughs> or Dumas, even though I never had a relationship with him because he went, but he had stacks of manuscript that Eugene gave me. And, um, finishing Tony Cade's 
last book before she died. I knew exactly what she would say. She was already there, you know, in that attitude about to whom she was talking, you know. She never, I never had to encourage it, but with some of the others, you could just indicate that they don't have to, that's not really the audience, and it wouldn't be private, you know, it would be like being Tolstoy. You're a Russian, and you write for Russians, not for little colored girls in Ohio. However, <laughs> it applies. You know, once you take your own area in your own soil and dig deep into that, and if you're good enough at it, it's available to everybody. <laughs> you don't have to direct it at an, a vague audience that you think is perhaps not yours. Yeah, and the greatest, I mean, for me, perhaps the greatest novel of female friendship, and certainly the most singular novel of black female friendship is Sula. Uh -huh. And I was interested in that because, you know, when I talk to my students, I'm like, give me a list of 10 novels about female friendship. And they're like, Sula? <laughs> If I say for them to do that for male friendship, they could just spin it out endlessly. Yeah. And I was curious about how your friendship with Tony Cade Bambara. I know that you were friends. Like the internet didn't lie about this one. Yeah. You know? And I'm wondering if this, if your, how does this relate, your ideas about friendship, your loyalty, and the way that you've written about female friendship in such a powerful way and in ways that are still revolutionary. I mean, it's hard for me to get my students to really? realize how limited the narrative female friendship mm. is in popular narrative. I hadn't thought about it that way, but I know that it was critical. I come to New York, <clears throat> I'm uh, divorced, I have two small children. I live wherever I live. Um, there's a classmate of mine named Betty Rose. She's divorced. She has two children. She lives in Queens. There's another woman. In other words, <laughs> there we became a kind of group of people who lived not in the neighborhood together, but behaving that way. Tony Cade was excellent at that. She lived in New York, then Georgia, then Philadelphia. I remember her coming into my house with two bags of groceries on, on, I, no one asked her. She didn't say she was coming. She just appeared. And she set the groceries down. And she said, I'll take care of the children today. You go do what you have to do. So it was that, you didn't have to ask. Everybody, particularly those of us who were without males, you know, controlling males in our lives. Uh, you know what I mean? Not bad, but you know, anyway, you know. <laughs> and there was a kind of singularity uh, and that intimacy, that instinct, knowing exactly what a sister needed before she could even articulate it was what was so important. So when I found out that Tony Cade could write, <laughs> you know, it was just like, uh, it's an amazing thing. Her, she had done a book called The Black Woman, I think, an anthology or something. But when I met her, she was doing this collection of short stories and they've been put around a lot, Raymond's Run. What was the name of that first collection? Um, Gorilla My, My Love. love. <laughs> Which, oh, that's a lovely story. <laughs> so she did that and then she did the seabirds and so on. And I just, you know, kept her, kept her moving. She had some other ideas about her future. And those of you who are able to read the novel, the big novel she wrote, the last one, These Bones Are Not My Child. If you read it, you can feel how cinematic it is. 
you know, it's all, it reads like a scene. No one is ever just still talking, they're doing something. And I knew that she was eager to become a filmmaker and to do films, and she did. She did the bombing of Osage Street, you know, about the... Anyway, that film, when the mayor of Philadelphia dropped that bomb on those people who were calling themselves yeah. African nation or something like yeah, that. Yeah, the move. Yeah, the move, move bombing. That's right. Yeah, the move bombing. So she did that. So anyway, but I miss her, I have to tell you, to this very day. It was a long time before I stopped wanting to pick up the phone <laughs> and say, what do you think about this? So, but she was very close. Gail Jones and I began that way. She was very shy and unaggressive. She would never call me anything but Mrs. Morrison. And I would say, my name is Tony. She wouldn't do it. And <laughs> she came in with the 50 pages of a very interesting story. And I said, no, 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 we need more, more, more. And she went back and she came back with Corregidora, which is an extraordinary novel. But you're right about that. I think it was out of necessity. And also, I think we all had a history and a memory of the vital, the necessity of women in our lives, in my, like my own, life and all of us had <clears throat> lived in a neighborhood or a block where that was a controlling vibe uh, in terms of getting real things done, in terms of hugging and holding and straightening and quarreling and <laughs> toughening up. That was the job of women. And they, um, you know, I have to say this and then I'll close. Uh, when the feminist began to be very articulate uh, and write articles and march and go meet in camps and have magazines and so on. I always said, that's interesting, they're having these huge meetings about feminism and the power of women and they're leaving all their black maids at home. <laughs> but that was indeed that separation, which was a race separation and perhaps even a class one, was very pronounced to me. And some African-American writers, I think Alice Walker has chosen other names for that, womanist as opposed to feminist mm. and so on. But the absence of those, you know, fierce black women, uh, no matter what the circumstances and the difficulty one had in negotiating socially. You know, I go into a house of, a, I don't know, somebody <clears throat> of stature and they introduce me to their housekeeper. And I say, hello, Mrs. Jones. And then I'm spoken to later by the mistress of the house who says, why did you call her Mrs. Jones? I call her Hattie, says the woman. And I say, I would never call a woman of age by her first name, never. So those differences were pronounced culturally and racially and so on. And I wanted to make that clear when I was accumulating, particularly the works of uh, African-American women writers. Extraordinary. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm always struck with that. Um, you know, I, 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 again, it's, this is a culture that overemphasizes that sort of heteronormative thing that for women, the most important relationship of their lives is going to be the dude that they're going to fall in love with, <laughs> as if everybody is straight and that this is, you know, this is the script. And yet, look, from my, just my experience as a brother, my sister's longest, most painful heartbreak was a Sula-like heartbreak where it was like the most important relationship of her life was a woman. And yet she never had a space to acknowledge or honor it until it was all over. 
And that idea of the controlling male or the controlling paradigm mm -hmm. that tends to leave that story out, I think is very, very important. I always knew my sister was in trouble whenever she started reading Sula religiously. <laughs> like, I was like, she's fighting with her girlfriends, you know? Well, you remember an interesting, uh, difficult line in Sula when the girls fall out oh, because yeah. one has slept, slept with her. And she says, I didn't, you know, I made love to him. I think there's another word for that. <coughs> but I didn't kill him. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't kill him. <laughs> what are you upset about? He's still alive. Yeah. There's something about it's not made of gold. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I, I think those characters, again, it's just something that runs through you, something that you said about um, characters that are dangerously free. Yes, I think yeah. that that's a perfect example of a character that's dangerously <laughs> free. When we look at Song of Solomon, of course, we have Guitar. Oh, yes. A character who's like dangerously <laughs> free. And I'm like always wondering because these are, these are figures who show up in our diaspora. And yet, again, one has to really strategize to write these and to capture and to evoke such a complex. And to be honest about it. Uh, about the danger they face and the danger they are. Uh, and at the same time, you, you're not, you know, striking an X through them because they're dangerous. There's something admirable, at least I felt, for those characters. Uh, and a kind of, um, not so much pride, but a certain kind of clarity, uh, knowing in my own family men like that who were uh, vulnerable, dangerous, and yet they were somehow ours, you know? They weren't the other. <laughs> so you do have empathy for their choices, some of which are bad, very yeah. bad choices. But nevertheless, you don't abandon them. Because I'm wondering, so it's, you think it's uh, from your experience? Because it is such an extraordinary, I mean, that concept of these characters that are dangerously free. Um, and when you read the books and you counter these guys, you're always like, for those of us who live in this world, the shock of recognition. Mm. There's that moment where you're like, oh shit, my uncle. <laughs> you know? Or, oh, there goes my sister. <laughs> right. But was this, so do you think this came out of the, this came out of exposure in your life, or is this something that you have circled around these kinds of people? In other words, is this something that you find a central preoccupation, or just came out during the writing? Some of it is people I knew uh, growing up, men and or women, but most of it is the latter. Um, the act of writing, for me, is you really do get to know the characters really well. Um, some people say, uh, I mean, writers have all sorts of ways in which they think that mystery happens. For me, they're sort of like ghosts. Uh, they're palpable. I know what they look like although I may not describe them, they talk. And if they're not talking to me, then I don't have their names right or something's wrong. But I can hear them and their speech, what they say, what they think, and I don't want to sound too goofy, but it's, it's like you really know. Some of them you have to shut up because like other ghosts or all ghosts, they don't have any conversation except about themselves. So I remember that was very true with Pilot. Oh, Pilot, my God. I had to just shut her up because she was eating up the book. She was really eating it up. And I, it wasn't about her. I mean, she was in it, but it was <laughs> the song of Solomon. <clears throat> she was part of that, but she was really taking it. And even when she spoke just a bit, like at the funeral, just of her daughter, and just, she was loved. I mean, she, 
just a few sentences, but said very powerfully, because that was one of those situations. And, uh, and I felt that this, you know, my father died just before I, while I was in the beginning of um, Song of Solomon, and I remember thinking to myself, oh God, I have to write about these men. I wonder what my father knew. Hmm. And nothing happened except I felt calm and that I would know that I had a access to someone who was one and who knew them. And so don't worry about it just because you're a girl. You know, it'll, it'll be there. And it was true for me in Song of Solomon. Yeah. No, I, you know, it's, it's funny because coming from the Caribbean and sort of that kind of African diasporic sort of Caribbean culture of respectability where people, you know, my mom always says, it's like, my mom will iron her skirt to go shoot you. Yeah, right. She's like, <laughs> she's like, mm, my hair looks good. Right. Now I'm going to kill you. You know, I think that what's extraordinary of coming from, you know, that African diasporic moment of which there's great diversity but from that Caribbean moment where there were so many restrictions and so many things about appearances and there's been this such an enormous history of containment and of non-free right. that when these characters appear both in our lives and I, again, when they appear in your fiction, it is a delirium <laughs> of like, wow, this is, yeah, this nothing is casts, nothing reflects how deep the shadow is to someone like Pilot or Charlie in the bluest eye appears. Yeah, I know. If I always think like characters like this appear to remind us how heavy the chains are. Indeed, you know? yeah, indeed. I love Charlie. Uh. Yeah. Well, I was gonna just um, sort of switch and ask you a question about something that again comes up. Um, I, again, if I, I, I kind of grew up in one of those worlds where, um, you know the question of the human was always in the air in my family. And my mother was always like, if you did the slightest thing that stepped out of bounds, that confirmed that you were an animal. <laughs> yeah? And this was something that was very, very charged in my family. I mean, no, I'm, I'm saying this for real. In a family like ours where, you know, both of my, both of my parents were of African descent, and there was this kind of obsessive respectability going on. And we used to joke around, we used to call it the island of Dr. Moreau. <laughs> because the slightest, if we picked up the fork correct, you're like, you're an animal. Yeah. You're not a human. <laughs> and I was gonna read a question um, that came out um, about something that occurs throughout your work. And now we're talking specifically about the fiction. Mm -hmm. um, this thin line between the animal and the human um, where I'm just going to read, you know, where there always seems to be this really powerful tension that the characters are aware of, or that they're facing, or that they're operating in. And of course, we see this uh, most classically in Beloved, in where, remember, Setha accuses Paul D of acting like she has four legs instead of two. That moment where you're like, yeah. you hear that, yeah? Um, and then, of course, in A Mercy, yeah, you remember when Florence is accused by blacksmith of being a slave by choice. And her anger transforms her into, quotes, into a kind of beast with feathers and claws. And even before that, Florence herself is concerned with what she calls her inside dark. This thing that is small, feathered, and toothy. And then we go to home where we have that wonderful opening section in home where, you know, the, um, the image of those two fighting stallions that rose up like men. We saw them like men they stood. And at the end, of course, of that section, there is, I really forgot about the burial. I only remembered the horses. They were so beautiful, so brutal and they stood like men. Besides the fact that you can like outright every motherfucker on the planet sentence by sentence. <laughs> yeah. And you one of us. There. Yeah. What's the sign word for that? Right. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> besides, <laughs> besides that little fact, that little fact that always puts me to bed comfortable, no matter what the hell's going on in the world, I'm always laying in bed and I'm like, yeah, the best writer of the world is of African descent. Peace. <laughs> so, <laughs> besides that small fact, yeah, I was curious about this line and curious about that tension that occurs again and again between the animal and human. I mean, does that strike you as completely insane that I... No, 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 no. I find the intimacy um, between animals, birds, whatever, the non-human, as a kind of extension of oneself, metaphorically or actually. Uh, when Paul D is in that chokehold with those prongs hanging out and he's on his way to prison, that rooster that he took out of the shell, uh, birthed him in a way, grew up and now the rooster is more free yeah. than he is. So seeing, I don't know, analogies or uh, parallels, comparisons with oneself and an animal, whether it's, you know, the, the clawing bird inside, um, it's hard to not, uh, fall for animal language when you're trying to say something really clear for the reader. You know what a clawing bird is, so if you put it inside yourself, if you've seen those horses stand up and fight, uh, then you know something about masculinity, beauty, <laughs> brutality and power, because that's the way they look. So the way they look to him, it's just a way to pull the reader in, uh, yank even, uh, so that they have this truly visceral response to another, to a character's thoughts or feelings and so on. And I can usually access that if, not always, but frequently, if I make the association with something that is not human, an animal. Yeah, no, it's, it's one of the things that, I mean, again, it's, it's an extraordinary, it's just beyond just the weight of your sort of metaphoric language. I think it, it speaks also very closely to, for me, it always feels that like, it's, there's something extraordinarily important about people who spend their entire historical life being compared to animals to then reclaim yeah, the ability the to engage the natural world mm -hmm. as a positive metaphor. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I spent my whole life, whether it's my family or white folks outside, being like, animalizing Don't us. Don't be. <laughs> you know? Yeah, right. Yeah. Not wanting to claim that. Yeah. As part of being human is the relationship or the metaphorical language or the parallels or what have you. So it wouldn't be estrangement you are animal-like, but to bring it into the discourse and the imagination as positive, or at least clarify. Yeah. I wanted to just touch two other areas and see then if we can perhaps, if there's a few questions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's especially, I, I kind of wanted to touch on Beloved for a second. I feel like, you know, we got to talk just a, a second on Beloved. Sure. There was this wonderful, like, little in one of the prefaces of one of the reprints where you say, um, around 1981, I was fired or quit Random House. <laughs> and I think my question is, which was it? <laughs> but more importantly, less gossipy, could of Beloved have been written if you had, if you had been working? No. No, I, the reason the fired quit thing, I, the books that we have extolled that I edited were not on bestseller lists, which is to say they didn't make any money. So I was there for 19 years, so that's pretty long. But eventually I began to edit part time, one day a week 
I would come into the office. I began to take one day off and teach at Yale. And they said, well, what are you doing taking one day off teaching at Yale? And I said, well, nobody edits anything in here on Fridays. <laughs> All you do is get on the phone or have lunch or something. So it's not a productive day. So they sort of agreed with that. But subsequently, so anyway, when I left, uh, I remember going home happy that I didn't have to go to work, not even frightened about not having a job. But I have a pier in front of my house on the river, and I remember going out there and sitting down, and I was very uh, uncomfortable or jittery or anxious or something, and I didn't understand quite what I was feeling. And then I thought, oh, this is what is known as happiness. <laughs> So this is how it feels. <laughs> and then I began, I literally, you know, began, the beloved, knowing that this girl, I could see her uh, walk up out of the river. She had on clothes and a little straw hat. <laughs> and at that time, in you know, writing about a, a real story, you know, that I would elaborate on about Margaret Garner, uh, who symbolized the pressure of the abolitionists and the pressure of the slave owners about what shall we do with this woman who kills her child and the abolitionists lost. They wanted her murdered, I mean, executed, because that would suggest that she was responsible for her children. And the slave owners wanted her taken back because she was to be guilty of theft, the theft of herself and the theft of her children. So in taking that, and I was trying to figure out what about the child she did kill? And uh, was that a good thing? Was that a correct thing? Was that a bad thing? Uh, the mother-in-law didn't seem to know in the newspapers. She said, I didn't know whether to con you know, hug her or condemn her. Uh, so I thought, well, the only person who really knows whether that was a good thing to do would be the dead daughter. And if I can get her in, you know, I'm not, I don't know. There might be circumstances in which I might have done a similar thing, or anybody might. But to ask the one person who does know, or thinks she knows, and is the true victim, and that meant that I had to have this character who could be a ghost, or might not be, or whatever, you know, to sort of move between the living and the dead, but to have a desire, powerful desire, as children do, but she's, you know, grown. But she still has the ferocity of a, of a murdered child. <laughs> you know, they never get enough. Hmm. Never. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, but oh. it's true that what you suggested at the beginning, it was after I left the daily grind of editing. Was it a lot of research for Beloved specifically? Because I, I, I can never encounter no. much conversation about you and your research. I've, I've seen you talk I about it. I had done this book called The Black Book. Mm, of course. And in that book was the newspaper articles about her. And I didn't want to know anymore because then I would have to, you know, toe the line. But just that what they said was enough. And I'll tell you, the back story is, at that time, this book came out in 83 or something, but at that time, um, women uh, who were being progressive and, you know, trying to knock down barriers and crack open ceilings, they were 
intimating that one of the things that would make a woman free was to not have children. Therefore, she should be able to uh, have access to abortion. And that was understood to be freedom. And I was thinking just the opposite. Nothing, I never felt more free in my life until I had children. Hmm. They were just the opposite of a burden. I mean, the, anyway, that's another story. But I, I thought, but for black women enslaved to have a child that you were responsible for, that was really yours, that was really freedom. Because they took those children. You didn't have children. You may have produced them, but they weren't yours. They could be sold, were sold. So to be a mother was the unbelievable freedom. And so when Margaret Garner cut that girl's neck, she was saying, this child is mine. And to claim her, even if it had to go and become bloody, nevertheless, that was the, that was the freedom, that was the uh, ability, that was the mothering. So it was just the opposite, you understand, of what some of the discourse was about the nature of freedom for contemporary women, as opposed to slave women. Yeah, I was wondering, because you know, it's especially, um, were you in the process of writing Beloved? I specifically think of the moment for me that was most suggestive and most shattering. Um, there's that just abhorrent moment and what I think the book, at least for me as a reader, sort of suggested, this is a horrid moment where um, Setha is being milked by a school teacher. Uh -huh. And her husband is trapped is above. <laughs> yeah, is trapped above. She herself is being horrifically violated. Her body and her subjectivity, she's the one experienced this violation. Her husband witnesses it but she survives to restructure herself to integrate that loss and he's shattered by it. He can't survive that. Were you aware of how, what an extraordinary like guide to reality that would present for many readers? I mean, when I think of, when I think guys, when I think about gender in my family, H half the shit that the women in my family endured, just the minor shit would have broken all of us men. <laughs> and there's something about the yeah. ability that, certainly in the books you write of women, to be able to integrate horrors in their identity. No, he couldn't watch that. Even Paul D, when she says that we beat her, he says they use cowhide on you, which is raw, you know, and it hurt. And she said, and they took my milk. milk. And he says, they used cow eye. And she said, no, you don't understand. They took my milk. This is, well, she's, this is her motherhood. She has food for her children. The scars, I don't know what they look like. I have never seen them. I know they're horrible. Somebody said they looked like a choke cherry tree. I don't know. But what they did, <laughs> that was awful and unimaginable and hurtful is they took her milk, which was for her children. You know? Yeah, and the inability to look for the male sort of masculine sort of <laughs> world to look into that right, right. space. And he couldn't even stand to see it, her husband. Yeah. Which I can imagine would be true. But if you're in it, I mean, she can't see it. I mean, she can feel it, but mm. it's not, you know, a big, oh my God, picture. It's what's inside. And what she's doing, she's going to mother her children. That's what she is. Extraordinary, yeah. You guys wanted to um, 
sort of talk about something that, again, you've touched on before, but I think it's sort of worth bringing up. And it's, of course, the, um, the opening of paradise. Uh -huh. Yeah. And a concept that you sort of plant, um, which is this idea about, you know, sort of this idea of kind of race. Do you remember this uh, uh, concept of very much race free? but um, race-specific, race yet yeah. race-free. Yeah. I mean, what is it for me, I guess, and especially with the confusion of the opening page and how readers are themselves, I think, often uncomfortable yeah. Yeah, with yeah. this. Well, I, I had written a story some years ago called Recitative. Oh, yeah. Is it true that that's your only published story? Yeah. Fuck. The only one. <laughs> wow. And uh, I thought it would be interesting to write about these two girls in an orphanage and who grow up to be women and use all of the cultural clues but confuse them so that the reader doesn't know which one is black and which one is white. And that was a language problem for me, you know, just withholding a color, withholding hair, withholding features, withholding all sorts of things. Um, so by the time I got to uh, writing Paradise, I had seen this thing in the Black Book again, newspapers, and there were, I don't know, 50 African American, what they call colored newspapers out there in Oklahoma. The whites were running out to get land. They, you know, killed all the Indians, ran them away, and then the United States go people this land. And there were a lot of ex-slaves and free slaves doing the same thing. And they established these black towns all over Kansas and Oklahoma. And they had these newspapers, and I was reading them, and they frequently said, almost all of them, they were trying to attract freed slaves to come to the territory and uh, they almost all said, come prepared or not at all. Hmm. Come prepared and not at all. Don't, you know. So I thought, uh, what would it be like to just end up out there after you walk from Mississippi or Florida or whatever, and then have some other Negroes tell you, you can't come in. Hmm. This is for us because you don't have any money. It sounds sort of familiar, contemporary. And so I thought, and then I saw pictures of them, the town fathers in the newspaper, and they were all very pale, you know, light-skinned colored men. So I organized this black town uh, who were like my great-grandmother, which I will tell you about. She was very tall pitch black, she came to our house and she looked at us and she said we'd been tampered with. <laughs> so that sort of stayed with me and my sister. I think that's going to stay with me. <laughs> that's what she said. So I thought, okay, so suppose there were other people like her who felt the purity the blood purity of Africans, you know, as opposed to these eh, mixed people. So I just designed it for that black town and then did the opposite for the convent where the women stay and you don't know who's black or who's white. But that's, you know, they shot the white girl first. They shot the white girl first. Man. And took their time with the rest. Okay, so there's some non-white people. So I want the reader to A, well, I don't want to do anything, just read the book, but I know that some people are going to look to see when that massacre takes place or when you examine those women out there, which one is the black girl or the white girl. And other people might be interested in it a little bit and then forget about it, forget about it. And then realize that these are three-dimensional characters with histories that are unique, aspirations that are different, and it doesn't matter 
whether they're black or white. It really doesn't matter if I don't let you know. Because when you do know, if I told you, the reader, who was black out there in the convent, then what would you know? He wouldn't know anything. That's not information. That's the least amount of information you can solicit from anybody. You just design a picture. Well, what do you know about that person? Nothing. That was my point. Yeah, it's a sort of thing. I, I, we, we talked a little bit before, and oh, yeah. you, we, you were, I didn't realize how, um, you know, one of the things, uh, I don't know, you probably didn't get a chance to do this, but the extraordinary amount of scholarship oh. around paradise. Yeah, I had to work Are any at grad students one. here working on this? <laughs> oh, my God. The extraordinary amount. I mean, it was, I never realized how people went all in, man. Oh, yeah. For some reason, that is one of the books of the late ones that I think people just wrap, couldn't wrap their noggins around. Now. No, that was difficult for a lot of readers, and they said so. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, you know, when I first began to write, I would do the research early. And because I like doing research, I mean, I really like it, I would just do it. You know, it would put the book aside, and this would lead to that which lead to that, and uh, having, you know, had a childhood as a page and someone who worked in the catalog department of a library in our hometown, um, really bookish, but looking up things was really important to me. So then I had to stop. So now I write the thing and I put TK if I don't know you know, is that really a train that comes from Seattle to <laughs> Chicago? Does it exist? Or does, what does it serve? All of that. And I have really, really good help to help me now. Otherwise, you just sit in the library forever. Now you can get it a little fast. But you're right. I, if, I, if I'm going to have a ghost in a book, then all the other stuff has to be absolutely accurate. It has to be exactly 28 miles from here to there because I have all this sort of magical whatever surrounding it. It makes it, it's fact. It's like the more accurate, the more ghost <laughs> yeah, the ghost right. becomes. It's true. I mean, it's you true. see the, this is a strategy that, I don't know if any of you guys read um, Dracula recently and the obsessive detail that Bram Stoker takes to all of the technical things, oh, all of wow. the trains, you know, the guy has the first model of a camera with him, Harper. Oh. <laughs> you know, he has his Kodak to show pictures of the house that Dracula's gonna buy. <laughs> and I always thought that that's like the best tactic to make the ghost more ghost. Yeah. The real has to be as exactly. intensely accurate as possible. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you, I'm, you're I'm deep sorry. into that stuff though, aren't you? Oh, I'm deep into Not all to, that uh, stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You making references to games and movies and characters. Now I have got to do some research in order to fully appreciate so many references in your book, Juno. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Who are these? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, part of that. I mean, part of that. I look. Part of that comes from um, a kind of a trick at the heart of the book for me has always been the, you know, how we, books invite us to read them in certain ways. And I think that it's important for readers to resist the immediate <laughs> invitation. And so I always thought like, especially when I wrote the novel Oscar Wilde, Oscar Wilde invites people to read the book as if all of that sort of like that nonstop nerd references it was just something that was there to sort of just confuse you and just to keep going. Yeah, it should. It should. Yeah. It's extraordinary though, really extraordinary. But you know, um, people are more likely, what's really fascinating is because a book about a dictatorship, a dictatorship, it's all about you granting authority to a narrative. And people are far more likely 
to grant authority to something that looks very official and sounds very official than to something that seems very frivolous and pop cultural. And what I thought was interesting about this stuff was there was this trick at the heart of the book, which was that most people wouldn't even bother to look up any of the cultural references, any of the pop stuff. I would. Oh, see, you're my kind of sister, man. <laughs> but the footnotes, oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> when I read that first one about Trujillo, I mean, that was just, it was uh, perfect. Well, <laughs> I think the, especially for those of us who are big history buffs, I, you know, as, a, as someone who grew up in big time history buff, a friend of mine says, you do everything possible to make sure nobody wants to read your book. <laughs> <laughs> but as a history buff, I couldn't resist it. <laughs> so um, I wanted to just one last question and then yeah. open it to the, just a small one. I was wondering if you could reflect a little bit on your most famous nonfiction book, your book of criticism playing in the, dark. in the dark. A book of criticism that I think for those of us in the field is extraordinary. I mean, if you had only written that, we could go home and smoke it, you know? <laughs> no, for real. Yeah, I know. Now, I was wondering the urgency of that book, and not only the urgency, but the incredible importance of it. Yeah. Um, and when you wrote it in your career, yeah. was it that you had at that moment to make that intervention? Was this something that had been sitting in you a long time? I, I had a course at Princeton. Oh, I didn't know that, see? <laughs> Somebody, is there a Princeton person clapping? <laughs> and that was part of the course, which in, again was instead of, just to reverse it, look how important the metaphorical uh, African or Africanism or Africanist dialogue is in American literature. Look how it wasn't even about racism so much as the assumption, like you said, of animal relationships. When I read in some Hemingway story, and he says, three men walked toward me. Two men walked toward me. One was a Cuban. And one was black. What? <laughs> the black had no country, has no history. He's just black. And then you have somebody, they could both be Cuban, probably were. Yeah. But he made the distinction. And you find it everywhere in when it's not about that, you know, the use uh, to which writers, whatever their reason, whether it's Melville, Faulkner's very open about it. I mean, about being good about it uh, and others. But I just wanted to identify the, f it's like a, I don't even know what else to call it. It's the Africanist imagination. Yeah. That's just there for the, it's available. It's true about gender as well, you know, but that's so obvious that it didn't seem worthwhile. But then I took those lectures and gave them at Harvard and uh, nobody was particularly pleased. No, no, <laughs> mentioning Mentioning the fact that white supremacy exists is a way to guarantee yourself <laughs> that you have no friends, it seems, you know? Well, not only was the uh, established white faculty uh, befuddled, I'll say, but the black faculty also, because what I was doing was moving them away from African-American texts and looking at routine white text. So at that initial point, you know, it was a little, what on earth is she saying? And then it became clearer and clearer, I think, as people really began to take me out of it and just, you know, read the book. And now I know that it has uh, a reputation for being significant in the academy. <laughs> That's the best understatement this week. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, I, I mean, I think for many of us, for many of us, again, um, 
I mean, this is what's sort of extraordinary, the, the sort of range and the depth of the talent is that, for me, it's, it is a, one of the most monumental counterattacks on the white supremacist imagination, which uh, implicates all of us. Yes. You know, I just, it's, it's a book that, like most of your books, I, I don't, can't imagine surviving the world without. So I wanted to thank you, madam, and uh. I wanted to turn this over for our good, good questions, yeah? All right, so a hand of applause, please, first. Now. Paul. So uh, while, while, while you collect your thoughts, I'd like to say that uh, there'll be a book signing afterwards, what, 92 books, a book signing will happen there. We have a wonderful independent bookstore. And I want to thank you so much, Tony, for, for coming today. Um, I must say that that moment when you said you discovered happiness, it's one, <laughs> one of the, the great, great moments this evening. And Juno Diaz, it was absolutely fantastic to have you here. And now I would like to ask for four very good questions. In my, <laughs> in, in my view, a question can be asked in about 52 seconds. So please go ahead. And uh, just to make this come, even come more... Come up to the mic. Thank you. And just to make this even more difficult and so that people feel even more pressure, I was hoping we could at least two of the questions could be from people under the age of 30. And two of them at least have to be from women. So, you've eliminated one of the male questions. <laughs> I hope it's good. Um, <clears throat> first of all, one of the best literary experiences I ever had was you read uh, Beloved to me as an audiobook. And oh. Was, it's the only way to consume that book. Um, I, want, I, I just wish you could elaborate on that idea of uh, digging into your own roots and then not needing to worry about who's reading it. I'd like to just hear more about that. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. I, um, I just, you know, I, I've read a lot in my life. I probably forgot most of it, but I read a lot of, uh, uh, I'm a classics minor. Uh, I read the standard English European books and so on. And there was something very specific culturally about many of the books. Why I got such a kick out of them uh, has something to do with the art. And it wasn't playing to, I mean, I don't mean that generally, but it was not a play. Uh, when I began writing Thula, The Bluest Eye, a lot of books that were successful, or at least had headlines, were written by young African-American men, which I call them the Screw Whitey books. Ah, yes. And it was all, you know, which not, was not illegitimate. Uh, and, uh, and I was saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I thought, wait a minute. Before that, before you get to this place where we're all beautiful, powerful, that, you know, whatever. I want to remind you what it was like before, when that kind of, uh, when racism hurt and could <laughs> kill you, if you believed it. The self-loathing was destructive. You know, I just want to get the history straight. Therefore, I did the bluest eye. And the rest of it was, me trying to write not for uh, the oppressor. You know, if he's sitting on my shoulder, looking at everything I do, judging it, I have to filter through that. That's not free. That's somebody else's story. So the deal was to get the little white gaze away and see what was left and to write that way. It's satisfying. Extraordinary. Not sure if I'm tall enough for this mic <laughs> at all, but I will do my best. Um, I 
need my notes. So <laughs> thank you in advance for pardoning my notes that I'm bringing with me. Um, so I'm in my first year as a high school English teacher at a school in New York City, a small public school. And <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so one of the first books that I was interested in teaching was Song of Solomon. This was actually rejected um, by the principal on the basis of being very difficult for struggling students in terms of their being able to think on a high enough level to really be able to engage effectively with the text. Um, my approach to this was that issues of race and the power of names and family histories that you focus on in the work are very important and very relevant to mm -hmm. students in general and particularly my group of students mm -hmm. that I'm working with. And I was curious how you feel about this sort of situation both in my school and in schools throughout New York City in general, this mm -hmm. sort of issue. It's a, it's a, all my books are banned. <laughs> Everywhere. I have a, a representation, a letter written from a prison executive, uh, super, you know what they call them, the head guy. Wardens. Warden type Mazza. people. <laughs> Mazza. Uh, informing my publisher that Song of Solomon could not be distributed to their people, inmates, and they had little blocks indicating why, and my block, the check that was for Song of Solomon, was that it might invite a prison riot. <laughs> so I thought, yay, I mean, <laughs> talk about a rough book. <laughs> Forget the Nobel Prize, man. I, know. <laughs> I don't know what to recommend. I think A Mercy might be an interesting book for your students because A is short, but also <laughs> it's before racism, racial laws were established. It's 1602, before the Salem witch trials. And so you get a different kind of, the kind of immigrant we tend to forget, the people who were running from horror stories not necessarily for religious freedom, just to be somewhere where the rain wasn't soot and you didn't all sleep in one room. And so, in also, uh, after Bacon's War, that was the first time that the city councils and the government said, any white man, can maim or kill any black person for any reason, and no black person shall have any weapons or any rights at all. That was written, so that was the end of that. And the obvious reasons were after the war, the, you know, the, the war was, uh, the warriors were landed gentry, Native Americans, black slaves, and indentured servants. So if you got all those three people together, it was over, right? So you separate them. And we give one the power to kill the other. And that's still going on metaphorically and actually in this country. You just separate them and make them hate each other. And now you, the master, are in control. I think that might be interesting for your students. I certainly agree. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say this has been an incredible experience. You, oh, you thank just you. you recite poetry. It's wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, you've touched a little bit on the use of the supernatural in your books, and I was wondering if you would just talk a little bit more about that, about the value of it and the meaning of it and the ways that you make use of it. Uh, Using supernatural in the text is uh, useful, but it's not totally mechanical because 
I grew up in a family where, uh, among very shrewd people, uh, and very, you know, outrageously honest people, uh, and very, very poor people. But part of their, part of what they talked about and believed had to do with what we call the ghosts or extraterrestrial and so on. Firm belief. Um, and the stories they told us, uh, which they would repeat, and then when we were old enough, we would have to tell the story. Same story. We might edit it a little bit, change the ending a little bit, but it would be that story. And they were all ghost stories, scary stories. And after they told them, they said, okay, go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> you go up these little dark steps. <laughs> uh, but, you know, most children's stories and poems are violent anyway. So that was, they had integrated ghost life or spiritual life as well as the spirits into everyday life. It was seamless, you know, for them. And there are lots of anecdotes I can tell about such things uh, that were helpful. You know, they could explain certain things. So that was part of it. The other part was to take that mindset, that philosophy, into the text, the magic, which was real. You know, my grandmother used to play the numbers, and she would ask me in the morning, what did I dream? And I would tell her, and she would look in the dream book and find the number and hit until she stopped or my dreams got <laughs> lunatic or something. Uh, and it, it, I don't know, it, it, it was, I wanted to say colorful, but it's more than that. It's living in a vibrant world that's not just your little house and your little eviction notice and your, you know, somebody sent you some, we used to call it relief instead of welfare, which I like much better than welfare. Relief sounds like just a little while, some relief till you can get yourself <laughs> Well, sometimes the meal had worms in it, you know. So, so there was that seriousness of life. But it, but it was peopled with a certain amount of magic and fantasy that they did not put aside as a kind of an entertainment thing. It was part of the life. So in many instances, I wanted it to be uh, part of the text of several of the books that I have written. Hi. Hi. Thank you to both of you. Um, I have a two-part question. One, can, can you speak to some of the authors that, have, that you see have influenced your work throughout your life? Um, and two, you spoke a little bit about your writing process uh, and the, the ghosts that you see that become the characters that speak to you that become in your book. But do they, does that mean that they surprise you? Or do you know? Are you guiding them as you're writing the book? Do you know what will happen in the, in the story before it happens? Do you sketch it out, or does it, how, how often are you surprised by the work that you create? Um, surprise isn't quite the word. Um, I, and I expect them to give it up. <laughs> I mean, who do they think they are? <laughs> I'm writing, so come on. I notice that if I don't have their names right, they don't talk. But if I get their names right, they're very talkative. I understand them completely, and they sort of understand what the job is. So, um, you know, it's an intimate relationship. And I am grateful, more grateful than surprised. You asked another question that I either didn't hear or forgot. You know, I'm 82 now, so. I can forget stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> the question was about, the, about authors that you see or, or works that you see have really influenced your own inspirations for you. Uh, none. 
in terms of inspiration. Uh, sometimes a line of poetry will kick something off. Uh, frequently music. Although I don't listen to music when I write. Uh, if I'm going to listen to music, I have to listen to the music. And I don't want to be doing other things. Uh, but uh, I just relish other people's writings enormously. You have to understand, as an editor, I have to have that separation. You know, when I edit another person's book, it doesn't have anything to do with what, the way I write or what I'm trying to get across. Same thing in teaching. When I teach creative writing, you know, it's how they're doing it. It has nothing to do with how I do it. So that the inspiration thing, like, is a little bit overdone, I think, in criticism as well as uh, creative writing classes. I, I tell my students, I tell everybody this, when I open, begin a creative writing class, I say, I know you've heard all your life, write what you know. Well, I am here to tell you, you don't know nothing. Ain't that the truth. So do not write what you know. Think up something else. You know? <laughs> write about a young Mexican woman working in a restaurant and can't speak English. Or write about a famous mistress in Paris who's down on her luck. Or, you know, I give them all these ideas, and I have to tell you, they really do well. They write way out of the box. Once you open that door and say, you know, I don't want to hear about your grandmother, I don't care about your lover, you better, you know, forget that. Let's go somewhere else. So, you know, that's my way. Toni Morrison. <laughs> Thank you. Madame. It's a pleasure. You could have come to the yes. reception. You I are? will be right with you. Me every once in a while.